So it's been well over a year since my first YouTube video, and I want to thank everyone for your continued support, feedback, and for watching. Since my first video was a retrospective on the original Dragon Warrior 7 for PS1, I think it would be fun to commemorate that by reviewing Dragon Quest 7 on 3DS. This was one of my most anticipated games of 2016, and I included a preview as part of my Dragon Warrior 7 retrospective. You can find a link to that video in the description below. Going into this game, I was already praising it based on sky-high expectations, and for better or for worse, it turned out to be substantially different than what I anticipated. But, is it a good game? Is it different enough from the PS1 original to warrant returning players to come back and play it again? And will newcomers to the title find it playable? Keep watching to find out. DQ7 was announced in October 2012 for release on February 7th, 2013 in Japan. Due to the length and episodic nature of the game, it was decided a portable console, the 3DS, would best suit the title so gamers could play in smaller portions by not being restricted to the television. Initially, there were no plans to release the game outside of Japan due to the cost and time it takes to convert and translate for other markets. Then, according to producer Yumiaki, Fans from France approached the dev team and they received letters not just for them but the CEOs of Square Enix and Nintendo requesting the localization of the game. There were even outside offers to localize DQ7 which would require an entirely new translation unique from the PlayStation game to adhere to Square Enix's modern localization styles. The power of the fans is really what made this happen," said Noriyoshi Fujimoto in an interview, who used fan input from sources such as online message boards to support the international release. Then finally, via a November 2015 Nintendo Direct, it was announced that Dragon Quest VII would come to other regions with the subtitle, Fragments of the Forgotten Past, and the game was released in North America on September 16, 2016. Considering the pre-release hype, sales for the game have been modest. According to VGCharts.com, 1.58 million copies of DQ7 for 3DS have been sold as of the time of this video, only about 120,000 of which are in North America and 130,000 in PAL regions. The game's beginning in particular has taken a lot of criticism. Initially, I thought this was just going to be a simplified version of the PlayStations, but it's been completely streamlined and dumbed down. You literally jump from location to location automatically and the puzzles have basically been removed from the start entirely. I get that the onset of the PS1 version received poor feedback for being cryptic, but seriously, now it's just going through the motions and making me wonder, what's the point? Lucky for us, the game picks up steam fast. We begin with the hero Oster, a fisherman's son living on the lone island of a vast ocean. When you and some friends gain possession of a strange shard and bring it to a derelict temple, you unlock a portal to a past land. The story unfolds by returning more shards to the temple to unlock other lost worlds with their own unique stories and mysteries to solve. When you save each land, you'll return to the present day to find it restored to the map. When you visit it, you'll see how what you did in the past affects the world now. This is an episodic yet clever and satisfying way to progress. Over the course of the adventure, you unravel the mystery of how the world became divided and how to restore and ultimately save it. The other main characters include the adventurous Prince Kiefer, the obstinate daughter of the town's mayor, Maribel, wolf-turned-human-boy Ruff, nomadic tribal dancer Aisha, and the resurrected warrior Sir Mervyn. Each brings their own tactical advantages and are made further customizable thanks to a robust job system. Compared to the original version, class advancement has been expediated by about 10% and I found it much more approachable being on a portable console. As you master jobs, more advanced vocations will become available and you'll also have access to monster classes. Although I would like to- SWEET MOTHER OF ERDRIC METAL SLIMES! I won't let you get away from me! No, not this time. Come on, get him! Nothing quite like bagging a metal slime. Anyway, although I would like to get more in-depth on classes, the complexity of the job system is too much to cover here. If you'd be interested in a video guide for it, let me know in the comments. The first thing that anyone that's played this game before will tell you is that it is huge, taking about 100 hours to complete. 
And if you want to do the side quests and complete the extra pedestals, do all the post-game, you're going to watch that number grow substantially. You'll notice several features from developer Art Piazza attempting to streamline the gameplay as it was felt today's audience would stop playing if they got stuck. For example, a detector on the bottom screen that flashes more quickly as you near an undiscovered fragment was added, as was a new character who is supposed to provide progression guidance but isn't particularly useful. So when you inevitably can't find a shard, just open the menu, go to Info, Next Tablet Fragment, and you'll get an actually helpful tip of where the next shard is. The bottom screen also displays a map with icons indicating your location or character attributes depending on the situation. The top screen shows the action and menus. The new translation means names of characters and locations have changed from the PlayStation version, making finding information online about monsters and locations unnecessarily bewildering. I have to say, the PlayStation 1 translation was better. To be fair, a lot of Dragon Quest fans do love this, but everything now is named as a pun. Take for instance the wolf riding support character named Ruff, which isn't even a pun, it's just what a dog says. They could have at least called him Barkley. And enemy names like a snail called Death Cargo and a wizard cat named Meowgician. It's like cheesy dad jokes. <laughs> and Dragon Quest fans, what's the deal with that really big moose? They should call him Ginormous. He's Ginormous. <laughs> that little jingle reminds me, I do need to mention the excellent soundtrack which was entirely reorchestrated by the Tokyo Metropolitan Symphony Orchestra and it sounds absolutely amazing. I can't help but sing along. Do 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 What I was most excited about was the visuals and the playstyle. And compared to the PS1 original, it's like night and day. But I got to say overall, I'm a little bit disappointed. I think the problem is, is that players went into it expecting a remastering, but what we got was more like a re-release with a fresh coat of paint. What I expected and hoped for is the Dragon Quest VII game running on a game engine similar to DQ8, but we are still bogged down by the same restrictions as the PS1 version. The camera just sucks. You have a static perspective of the heroes, and you can pan around, but the camera control and angles are extremely limited. This is a pretty big disappointment and takes some getting used to. Ah, I hate this odd effect with walls being transparent, but for some reason things like windows and pictures remain opaque. The game is compatible with the system's 3D capabilities, but I almost never used it, and in this circumstance I suggest you don't either. Visually, I was expecting more based on the pre-release footage. The character sprites look good and are fun to watch both in and out of battle, but the environments and textures appear flat and dull leaving much to be desired. One of the biggest changes from the PS1 version is battles are not random, you'll see enemies on the overworld to encounter. Battles are your standard JRPG affairs, being turn-based and using a small variety of tactics. You'll be aided by the weapons and armor you equip, the spells and skills you learn, and the items you obtain. I guess I was expecting more of a reboot of the game, but in the end what we have is a remake that is masked by the visual presentation, making you think you're getting something totally new. Like all Dragon Quest games, 7 is loaded with extra content to keep you busy. Mastering the job classes and the two bonus dungeons, sure, but countless hours can be spent finding mini medals and at the casino playing poker, slots, and my personal favorite, the memory card game. The largest side quests all depend on your progress on The Haven, a town that grows as you find people and monsters willing to become residents there. Once the town reaches a certain size, you'll have access to the download bar. Here you'll be able to import residents via street pass encounters and download Traveler's Tablets. Those Traveler's Tablets are for special dungeons you can access at the Haven. Most aren't particularly interesting, but some of them have a story associated with them, including a great one centered around Kiefer. And others are for a challenge or collecting loot, gold, and experience points. You'll also find Monster Meadows, a safe home for monsters that you tame in battle. Those monsters have different habitats though, so you'll need to find specific enclosure plants throughout the world to build their homes so you can go visit them. Once you have a monster tamed and in the meadow, you can send them off to find Traveler's Tablets in the Haven. The monsters that find the tablet are featured in that tablet's dungeon. Finally, monster stamps can then be collected by defeating an enemy in the tablet dungeon. There are hundreds of these, so start taming monsters early if you want to 100% the game. 
I can't explain why, but for some reason I really did enjoy the extra content, even though I found it quite confusing, sloppily put together, and much like the job system, it's complicated enough to warrant its own guide. I know that I had a lot of criticisms to say about Dragon Quest VII, but that's mostly because my expectations were just so high for it. This is still a really great game that I thoroughly enjoyed playing through, and it's sad to see that it's really being overlooked by a lot of players. If I could change one thing, it would be to have included the option to play the original PlayStation version. The portability is the main reason to play the 3DS version, but otherwise I would slightly prefer the PS1 game. I recommend Dragon Quest VII on 3DS for players who are big Dragon Quest fans, especially those who played Dragon Warrior VII on PS1, are fans of traditional turn-based JRPGs, don't mind the dated 3D visuals, enjoy mission-based objectives, and who are looking for a long and involving game to play on the go. As always, thanks for watching. Let me know in the comments what you think of Dragon Quest VII. Is it better than the original? Does it deserve the criticism it receives? Also, I would love to know what you thought of this video and what you'd like to see in future episodes. Don't forget to subscribe for all things Dragon Quest and retro style game videos. See you next time.